Many believe that the police, prison system and border enforcement are there to keep us safe. Yet very little of the violence and harm in today's society is dealt with by the police and when it is, the criminal justice system causes further harm, especially for marginalised groups. Many have experienced the failures of the criminal justice system and witnessed repeated failed attempts to reform these institutions. These reforms claim to mitigate the problems with policing but in fact strengthen and expand its powers of surveillance and punishment. Abolition rejects these reforms. It seeks to end the use of prisons, policing, border enforcement and other punitive institutions that fail to deliver justice and safety. It seeks to build a society that cares for all, acts to prevent harm and works to genuinely make society safer. The majority of cases handled by the police will be better served with a model that works to prevent and reduce harm and build for social justice. Instead, policing and prisons exacerbate inequality driven by social injustices which the police were never designed to deal with. While abolitionist ideas such as calls to defund the police have begun to enter the UK mainstream, abolition is often understood as a specifically US phenomenon. Yet, abolition and movements for liberation from British policing have been ongoing for as long as the police have existed. It's important to recognise the colonial history of the police and its ongoing legacies. When the Metropolitan Police was set up in 1829 by Robert Peel, it was modelled on the Royal Irish Constabulary that Peel had been instrumental in setting up as Chief Secretary for Britain's first colony, Ireland. From the beginning, the police were tasked with upholding the authority of the British state and protecting the wealthy from the poor and those deemed threatening and disorderly. Modern British policing still uses tactics developed through colonial rule. Colonial police in places such as India and Kenya designated whole communities as suspects and subjected them to surveillance and collective punishment while justifying rights abuses on the basis of racist ideas of white superiority. British policing continues to be at the centre of global technology and training networks. The UK uses development aid to fund policing and border enforcement overseas, and it trains and equips overtly authoritarian policing regimes in Hong Kong, Bahrain and the US amongst others. Moreover, Britain is at the centre of the global policing and arms industry, with DSEI, the world's largest arms fair, held every two years at London's Excel Centre. The racist impact of policing continues to be a stark feature of the UK criminal justice system. After the failure to investigate the murder of Stephen Lawrence in 1993, the Metropolitan Police were found to be professionally incompetent and institutionally racist in the McPherson report. A description that many police leaders, such as former Police Chief Cressida Dick, continue to deny. Despite decades of criticism, aggressive stop and search still disproportionately targets working class people and people of colour. It's widely reported that black people are nine times more likely to be stopped and searched than white people. People of colour are roughly 14% of the general population, but make up 25% of the adult prison population and a shocking 41% of the youth prison population. In 2015, the proportion of black people in the UK who were in prison was greater than the equivalent statistic in the US. And 5% of Britain's prisoners consider themselves Gypsy, Romany or Traveller. But these groups make up only 0.1% of the UK population. The consequences of contact with the criminal justice system are often harmful and sometimes deadly. There have been over 1,700 deaths in police custody since 1990. But in this time, there has only been one prosecution for manslaughter for a police officer. Groups like the United Friends and Families Campaign and Inquest have long campaigned for police accountability in relation to these deaths. Police and prison violence relies upon the criminalisation of drugs, sex work, migration, poverty, and protest that punishes the poor while failing to make society safer. By treating drug use as a matter for criminal punishment rather than public health, 
The UK imprisons 12,000 people on drug charges, whilst maintaining the highest rates of drug mortality in Europe. Current UK legislation criminalises sex workers working together for safety. Under the guise of fighting exploitation and protecting vulnerable women, the law against brothel keeping criminalises workers who work together for safety, meaning they can be raided by police or border officials and sex workers to be arrested and sometimes deported. While homelessness has increased 141% since the beginning of austerity in 2010, the police still regularly use the 200-year-old Vagrancy Act to harass and impose fines on rough sleepers. Police routinely target protests and dissent with blanket stop and search powers drawn from Section 60 of the Criminal Justice and Public Order Act 1994, which was brought in to repress travellers, squatters and environmentalists. This pattern is repeated by the new policing bill, which criminalises intentional trespass and adds to the police's powers to ban protest. Surveillance is becoming increasingly threaded through public and private life in programmes like the Hostile Environment and Prevent. Data gathered through health, education and welfare is routinely being shared with the police and immigration control. These policies obligate public sector workers to become informers for immigration control and counter-terrorism with racist outcomes targeting people of colour and the Muslim community in particular. The targeted brutality of policing and prisons have been challenged repeatedly through protest and resistance. However, demands for change are often channeled by the state into programmes of reform, which don't address the underlying issues. As a result, we see over and over reforms fail to limit the damaging effects of policing and serve to legitimise its harmful and unaccountable practices. For example, protests against the racist SUS laws resulted in the passing of the Police and Criminal Evidence Act 1984 that provides the legal basis for today's stop and search regime. As criticism of stop and search continues, the state offers new best use of stop and search guidelines and body cameras that maintain the police's power over working class black and brown communities. In other words, reforms meant that one set of old racist laws were merely replaced by a new set of racist stop and search practices. We see similar failures of reform when it comes to prisons. As prisoner numbers were rising in the 1990s, electronic tagging was proposed as an alternative to imprisonment. However, in practice, electronic monitoring acts as an additional form of punishment, widening the carceral net while failing to reduce numbers of people in prison. Warehousing people in prisons exacerbates social problems like poverty, unemployment and homelessness while subjecting people to overcrowded conditions and solitary confinement. Despite the repeated failure of prisons to make positive changes in the lives of prisoners, the government continues to send more and more people to prison and to build more and more prison spaces. The prison population has doubled since the early 1990s, with no effect on making communities safer. Yet the government is planning on expanding prisons by nearly 22,000 places. That is, by building new prisons in Glasgow, Leicester and Wellingborough, and adding ever more beds to already existing overpopulated and inhumane prisons. Far from being singularly relevant to the US, the need to drastically reduce the scope and severity of the criminal justice system and instigate social and economic changes that render police and prisons obsolete emanates from the injustices of the British state. The past 200 years of trying to reform police and prisons have repeatedly failed. The same problems happen over and over and reforms haven't made us safer. Reforms fail because they don't question the underlying logics or values of the system. Calls for more due process, body cameras, police training, better prisons, further inquiries and other minor reforms serve to legitimise the existence of policing institutions but will fail to alter their colonial, racist and punitive character. We need a different approach. Abolition offers us that approach. Abolition is about defunding and dismantling these institutions at the same time as we build up alternative responses to harm. 
These alternatives mean redirecting money away from the police and prisons and channelling resources into violence prevention and harm reduction work. It means properly supporting victims of violence, providing better health care and housing to everybody and tackling social inequalities. Above all, abolition is about creating a society that cares for all. Thank you.